Hello, good afternoon everyone. A big welcome to all at City in Nature, Conversation to Action, jointly organised by City Developments Limited and East Coast GRC Grassroots Organisation. My name is MJ and I will be your MC for today. Oh, thank you! <laughs> As you may know, 2023 was the warmest year on record with deadly extreme weather events occurring under global warming of about 1.1 degrees Celsius. I'm sure you guys remember how hot it was in May last year, which is not very surprising because we did hit a 40-year high record of 37 degrees Celsius then. According to the results of Singapore's third climate change study launched just last month, we will be experiencing increased air temperature, wind speed, sea level, and rainfall. Things are only about to get worse unless we take immediate action. Hence, the power of public-private partnerships in the battle against the climate emergency cannot be understated and the role of youths is pivotal. The youth movement continues to grow and we are seeing more and more youth negotiators and legislators along with youth activists, journalists, writers, and more. The power of us is palpable, especially with the incredible opportunities provided by both the private sector and the government. As a youth myself, I was honoured to be able to attend COP28 a few months ago as a partner of the Singapore Pavilion, alongside 20 other youths from the first ever Climate Youth Development Programme, also known as CYDP, jointly led by MSC, NCCS and NYC. I was also fortunate enough to be supported by CDL to join in a once-in-a-lifetime dream Antarctic climate expedition last February as the winner of the CDL E-Generation Challenge led by the legendary Dr. Sylvia Earle, 88-year-old marine scientist and oceanographer and Time Magazine's first hero of the planet. On this trip, I documented the various impacts of climate change in the Antarctic and in the video that I'm about to play soon, you'll get a glimpse of our expedition and hear special messages from the ACE ambassadors. Please enjoy. In February of 2023, with the support from City Developments Limited, Ocean Geographic and other sponsors, 120 ambassadors from over 20 countries aboard the Silver Earl on a journey that would change their lives. Hi, I'm Andrew Charlton from Indonesia. My name is Noor Tucker. Um, I come from Turkey. I live right outside Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm from India. I'm from a city, Hyderabad. I'm a proud Kukulab woman. I'm the Minister for Climate Change and Emissions Reduction in the Australian Capital Territory. I'm Esther N, Chief Sustainability Officer of City Developments Limited, headquartered in Singapore. David, do you want to go first? No, ladies first, please. She always does that. We come from different countries, belong to different generations, share different cultures, and join for different reasons. So Antarctica, why do we keep, why? why did we come to this, David? Antarctica, Antarctica is the most fascinating, incredible place on our planet. This expedition is a really important opportunity to tell the world about climate change. I think it's a really good chance to get inspired. I'm very interested in intergenerational perspectives from different cultures, a proper mission and something positive to come out of it. But we've all gathered here on this expedition because we have one belief, climate change is real, it is urgent and we have to do something about it. That is very obvious that it's warmer in Antarctica now than it was 20 years ago when I first started coming here. We've already seen that penguin colonies are moving because there's no more krill from where they were. What is happening with the ice and the progression of the ice sheet? Hearing the glaciologists talk about, you know, this is actually what's causing sea levels rising. That's what's causing that for my people. In 2050, there's going to be more plastic than fish in the oceans. And I really don't want that to happen. Almost every story we start at the National Geographic may or may not be climate change, but by the end, it's climate change. Just in the span of 10 years, the coral reefs have changed, the fish have changed, everything has changed. We've had a number of one in 100 floods, quite a few one in 100 bushfires. These are extreme weather conditions that we haven't experienced before. This is the polar region, this has the threat, and this has the crisis, but it will not stay within the polar region. And if we lose this, we then see that knock-on effect in places like the Maldives where we work, where 
the small communities will be suffering. Climate change isn't a problem that we need more science. It's a problem of actually affecting change and actually moving policy. This is the critical decade for action on climate change. Throughout this journey of ice, penguins and seals, we gain knowledge about the world around us, we discussed climate issues and drew resolutions, and we found the strength to support one another and amplify our voices. We thought we have done a lot over the last 20 years as a corporate you know, leader in sustainability and uh, in my area as a green building champion. But I think there are a lot more we need to do, whether engaging the public sector, private sector or people sector. From this expedition, uh, obviously I learned a lot. Deep sea mining from talk that Sylvia Earle and Vassar gave. Oh, there's hope for that. Or, oh, actually, I've never thought about it in that way. To share some of my own experience as a city that is already cut our emissions by more than 45% to tell that story that it's possible. What I realise is change has to come from within myself. So I always keep reflecting on, my, on myself, like what I can change myself. Collectively, if we all act singly, it makes, we make a difference. Individually, it all adds up. So to me, the value of having such an eclectic group of people and having the time to debate and discuss and think through these issues has been extremely valuable. The responsibility, as I said, starts with me now. No matter who you are, whether an individual or a, a organization or a non-profit, our differences can't divide us if the issue at hand is large enough. Because what happens is we grow up and we say, oh, well, it's the next generation's problems. That stops now. The buck stops now. There are a lot of people doing a lot of work to try and improve the state of things um, and I think just the more that we can give power to those people and raise their voices up um, is things things will start to happen. Most importantly when the future seems bleak amidst the climate crisis we saw light at the end of the tunnel. Hope! Hope for a better environment, hope for a better planet and hope for a better future. We should educate all the future generation of how precious this place is. And unless we do something about it now. That will affect every part of the world. We have done enough research to understand where we are perhaps going wrong. I think we always have to look at it with hope. Sylvia Earle does this brilliantly. She always talks about hope. I hope that we are living in harmony and reconnect that human nature interaction. I hope that future generations have a thriving planet and specifically a thriving ocean. It's very simple. I want to see a future where the people, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren are living on a planet in better harmony than our generation ever could imagine. I think it's given me more optimism. I think I came with maybe a more cynical or um, anxious perspective and I think it's given me, given me hope. This is the Antarctic Climate Expedition and this is our legacy. I'm Sylvia Earle. I'm an explorer, a scientist, and I've been a witness to the most remarkable time of change. We have learned more in my lifetime than during all preceding history. No one could know what Earth looked like from high in the sky. No one knew what it was like in the deepest parts of the ocean. And no one really understood the connection between Antarctica the Arctic, the ocean, the atmosphere, the climate, life on Earth, our lives, all connected. The good news, now we know. We have to take care of nature. We have to take care of the ocean as if our lives depend on it, because they do. We saw firsthand how global warming has affected the Antarctic, the only continent without a permanent human population. Glacial melting and rising sea levels are real and their impacts will ripple globally. Do visit the Melting Ice, Sinking Cities Climate Action Exhibition at the CDL Green Gallery in the Singapore Botanic Gardens where you can find out more about the expedition and how rising temperatures can impact the world. This exhibition will end next month. So, Go there quickly, all right? On the screen, you will see some amazing East Coast initiatives that you may be interested in participating. If so, you can approach the East Coast Sustainability and Green Plan booth outside after the dialogue. 
Today, we will zoom into what climate change means for all of us in Singapore and how we can better understand and prepare for the change to our lives today and in the future. Kicking off the program for today, we have the privilege to hear from Dr. Winston Chow, the boy from Badok, but also co-chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 2 and Professor of Urban Climate and Lee Kong Chian Research Fellow at Singapore Management University. This will be followed by a Kahoot quiz from which you can win attractive CDL vouchers. The highlight of today's program will be a conversation with DPM Mr. Heng Sui Kiet and Dr. Winston Chow, moderated by CDL's Chief Sustainability Officer, Ms. Esther An. Before we kickstart Dr. Winston Chow's presentation, please go to the Kahoot website on your phones so we can jump straight into the quiz later. Do remember to not close the tab once you've entered the website, okay? So all you need to do is switch tabs later on. All right. So without further ado, may I please invite Dr. Winston Chow to the stage to share his presentation. Dr. Chow, please. Thanks, MJ. Right, good afternoon, everyone. Good to see so many, uh, some old friends, some new friends here today. As MJ uh, pointed out, uh, I'm very happy to be here in home ground, on home ground actually in the East Coast. Uh, so my day job is I'm a professor of urban climate at SMU, where I try to corrupt my students into persuading them that uh, climate change is real and there's something people can do to make a difference there. My other job is that together with uh, Professor Bart van den Hoek from the Netherlands, I lead a team of uh, scientists. I lead a team of uh, people who are concerned about climate change in how to adapt, how to reduce the impacts and how to reduce the vulnerability arising from climate change. So it's a, a little bit I know growing up just down the road in Badok that I'll end up in this situation. So I'm here to actually just give a story. I'm not going to include a lot of text in my presentation as you'll see. Lots of pictures and hopefully try to compel um, from this conversation some degree of action amongst uh, the people in this room and beyond uh, to try and make a difference about climate change. And also I understand I'm on a strict time limit so I'll try and finish everything otherwise MJ will hit me off the stage at 4 p.m. To begin, I like using this GIF, this spiral plot behind me. There, this tells us mean temperatures from um, the middle of the 19th century until present day. It has two literal lines, one at 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius. Uh, these lines are not arbitrary. They are there for a reason because in 2015 in Paris, uh, 195 countries agreed to limit warming to 2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial era with an intention of restricting it to 1.5. The worrying thing is that you'll see that there are parts of the year uh, in recent times that have exceeded that 1.5 degree C limit. Um, my colleagues at the IPCC have pointed out that we will probably very likely exceed that limit uh, across all 12 months of the year as early as 2032, if not sooner. Uh, that's the big concern. The other thing to note is that these temperatures are not they, are not, they don't increase naturally. They increase because if you look at the two figures on your right, uh, there's a strong correlation between how emissions of greenhouse gases, particularly that of CO2, carbon dioxide, have increased very, very steadily over the past uh, 50 to 60 years. And if you look at the bottom plot, it's been uh, very anomalous since uh, more than 800,000 years uh, before present day. It's not just a correlation. I mean, um, the science behind, the physics behind climate change, we know that there is a strong radiative trapping mechanism that CO2 has that is linked to the increase of temperatures behind us. So we know that if there's that strong link and that information can be processed by a lot of people, you can then drive that action towards reducing emissions and trying to maintain that limit of 2 degrees or 1.5 in the future. As MJ mentioned, uh, about a month ago, earlier, 
about a month ago, about four weeks ago, uh, the Centre for Climate Research Singapore, the Meteorological Services of Singapore, and NEA released the findings of the V3, or the third National Climate Change Study um, that, that was done. And they, there are some very, shall we say, concerning results arising from that. One of which is that temperatures will continue to increase across a variety of emission scenarios, low, medium and high. We are going to experience warmer temperatures uh, in the near future, both during the daytime and during the nighttime as well. Uh, if we were to look at the present day temperatures of about 27.9, you might think that, hmm, that's, that's okay, we can tolerate that a bit. But if you look at the maximum temperatures, it will, it will increase uh, to anywhere from 32 to about 36 and a half degrees Celsius. Very uncomfortable for those of us even who have been here for a long time. Now, the temperatures that you saw uh, increase is not just from the greenhouse gases I talked about. It's also from the land cover change that we see in Singapore. This GIF that you see behind me uh, documents how much land cover change has happened uh, since the 1980s all the way until recently. You can tell, I mean, from our part of the coast, we've expanded a bit with the expansion of Changi Airport. If you live in the west, you can see the Tuas industrial area and the hockey stick also showing that land use, land cover change. What happens is that you, when you replace all that vegetation, with uh, concrete and asphalt, and you put air conditioning that transfers the heat indoors, outdoors, you also drive that temperature change. So some research has indicated that about half of Singapore's warming is due to, the half of Singapore's increased warming is due to this urbanization. In other words, the urban heat island effect is quite real. So in the course of my work, uh, recently I contributed to a chapter that Professor Tommy Ko and others wrote about um, uh, nature in Singapore, I had to dig up some old photos of myself. So for those of you who have grown up in um, Badok, you might recognize this area. It's just uh, down New Upper Changi Road, Block 58 at the Marketplace, which has very good makan. Uh, that was me. Uh, I won't say when, but it's a long time ago. If you were to, then I overlaid it with a recent picture. You can tell the difference between what I was sitting next to in my stroller versus what you see today at the marketplace, it's testament to the sort of rapid development. We've sort of um, replaced all that vegetation uh, with concrete spaces, and we must not lose that, because we know from uh, best available science, nature plays an important role in regulating temperatures. So it's important to remember that. It's not just the temperatures that are concerning. Uh, we, it, I always tell visitors to Singapore, you might experience 30, 35 Celsius temperatures, but it's also the humidity that is important. In the V3 study, there was some analysis on heat stress, which is a combination of not just temperatures, but also humidity, wind speed, and solar exposure. And there's an index called the wet bulb dope temperatures that uh, the V3 study looked into. And it's quite worrying that under um, future projections of low, medium and high emission scenarios, uh, regardless of those scenarios, you'll see an uh, increase in the amounts of high heat stress conditions. If you are working outdoors all the time, if you are serving national service, if you are of the silver generation, or if you're very young, these are four vulnerable population categories that will be subject to higher heat stress and can lead to incidences of heat stress, heat stroke, heat mortality incidents. So this is something that is quite concerning in a climate warming uh, future that we will face. MJ also mentioned that it's not the temperatures and the heat stress, it's also the variability of how much rainfall we will face. Uh, we can have periods of extremes in too much rain, or too little rain in the future. On the picture on the left, it depicts where some areas of increased rainfall are found. Uh, and although the number says 6 to 92%, you might think that's very high. But the, the most important point is where the rainfall is located. And in some places in Singapore, uh, there, might be places, there might be issues of flooding that might occur. So uh, government agencies or communities have to watch out for that possibility in the future. On the flip side, it's not a matter of just more water. There can be times when there's less water, dry periods that will happen that might stress our reservoirs, that might stress our plants that we try and water and grow in our communities. 
that might happen as well with periods of more intense dry, dry conditions that will happen in Singapore uh, in a climate warming future. And lastly, this is the climate impact that, uh, frank, quite frankly, um, keeps me awake at night. How uh, in 2019, um, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong mentioned that you know, climate change is an existential threat to Singapore. This is one of the impacts that is of great concern. We are an island state, and how the rising seas will affect us in the future. Uh, it might lead to coastal inundation, it might lead to increased floods, uh, it might lead to increased impacts around East Coast and elsewhere. So again, we've experienced uh, quite a bit of sea level rise, uh, about what, 20 centimetres already over the, past th uh, uh, over the past 40 plus years or so. Regardless of what warming scenario we find, we will be experiencing sea level rise in the future. By the end of this century, anywhere from 30 centimetres to more than a metre, and maybe up to 2 metres by 2150. Those figures are quite concerning, especially when we have three options to deal with sea level rise. Either we protect our coastlines against SLR, sea level rise, or we try and develop and advance the coastline to deal with that, or we retreat. We retreat, that means we give up the coastline to the seas. And from those three options, you can probably guess or infer one of them is not an option for Singapore. So, uh, that's me by East Coast. You can probably recognize that, uh, oh, that's my grandma on the right picture. You can probably discern the breakwater on East Coast. So, in the early 1980s, the sea level was about, I'd say, 10, 15 centimeters lower than it is today. The concern is that we've already seen with some impacts, especially during king tide periods, times of the year when the uh, orientation of the moon and the sun makes the tide a bit higher than normal. Typically, Singapore's high tide is about 2.7 meters above the mean sea level. In, during king tide events, it can exceed 3.7 meters above sea level. Some noticeable king tide events happened in where I was uh, in the East Coast. Uh, in, I was around in 1999, where parts of Singapore's coastline was flooded. One of my old professors in NUS Geography, Wong Po Po, uh, we had a good chat about this of king tide phenomena last week. He's documented what the impacts are during king tide events in 1974, east coast on the left. In the center, this is Pasiris. On the right, is also Pasiris in 1999 in December and 2011. So these are somewhat of a proxy or an illustration of what rising sea levels can happen, you know, can impact upon Singapore's coastline uh, on a very periodic basis. And if I remember the 1999 event, there was the old McDonald's at the uh, East Coast Park area close to the Marine Parade exit. This, the waters came rushing in to about ankle depth to that uh, parts of uh, East Coast. So that will be the future that we will face uh, in terms of the sea level rise impacts uh, under several warming scenarios to watch out for. So one way to deal with it is the Long Island, um, proposed Long Island that we'll be seeing along the East Coast. It's a way of, as I mentioned, there are three ways to deal with sea level rise. We can advance, and this is one way to do so, using the Long Island plan. We can build or reclaim land out of the east, current East Coast uh, shoreline. We can have uh, what we call nature-based solutions, green spaces on top of it. Make sure it's publicly accessible for people to enjoy their park space. But it also fulfills a function of preventing the sea level from getting into where the current East Coast shoreline is. Uh, on top of that, there's an additional benefit of an additional new reservoir to increase our resilience against droughts and dry spells that were also forecast in the future. Uh, and there are more opportunities, as you can see from the URA slide behind me, in terms of uh, new developments, recreation destinations, etc., etc. So some of the artist's impressions of how it will look like, you can see that on the slide on the right. I will end, and it's almost four o'clock, I will end my, my story by pointing out that yes, there is bad news in the future. Yes, uh, all the best scientific analysis indicate that we're in for quite a rough ride, uh, be it in the near, medium or long term. Uh, if you were a senior 
um, data generation or pioneer generation, if you're born in the 1950s or thereabouts, you've already experienced about 1.1 degrees C warming. If you're in my generation, we've experienced about 0.8, close to 1 degree C warming. The concern is that the folks born today or over the past few years, they are in for a very rough ride in the future. And how we deal with it, this is the important thing. The future is not fixed. The future is still unwritten. There are several emission scenarios that you can see on the right post-2020 that uh, my colleagues in the IPCC developed in the last assessment report. We want to avoid the very high, high and intermediate emission scenarios. We want to keep the low and very low scenarios that are fundamental in the development of the Paris Agreement. The actions we take now in terms of being aware of what's present in the climate pipeline, making sure that we look into new technologies or new actions that reduce the impacts and reduce emissions into the future, it still can allow us to pivot towards the future of a low or very low emission scenario where temperatures are still kept to that 1.5 degree C limit in the Paris Agreement. So hopefully this talk or this, this conversation that I have had uh, helps to spur some action uh, in the audience and you can spread you know, the, this sort of message to your friends and family and uh, try to make sure that we avert that very warm future that we have and we pivot towards a Paris-friendly agreement, a uh, no, Paris-friendly future that uh, I hope we'll, we will see or my kids will see in the next 30 to 60 years. Okay, with that, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Chow, for that very insightful sharing and for breaking down all of this complex science and sharing it with the audience so that we can better understand the state of things as it is currently. Next up, our Kahoot quiz. Okay, so before the conversation, we'll have some questions on sustainability and you all will have a chance to win CDL vouchers. The champion will win $100, the first runner-up $70 and second runner-up $50. That's like... 100 siumais, 70 siumais, 50 siumais, so everyone please join. Uh, if you haven't already, you can scan the QR code or you can type in the website and oh, wow, wow, wow. Okay, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Let's do it, let's do it. Come on, come on, you hit 100. Okay, let's go 150. Okay, you come all the way here. Might as well join, right? Come on, come on, let's all join, let's all join. Can we hit 200? Let's do it. Come on, come on, come on. Ten more. All right, all right. Okay, so we're going to give maybe around 20 seconds before we officially start. Any of you all still trying very hard to log in? If not, we're going to start in... in... five. Oh, oh my goodness. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Five... four... Hey, why is it dropping? Okay, three, two, okay. Shall we start, guys? All right. Okay, let's go. Get ready. Fast as fingers first. What is the formal definition of climate change that was set up by the United Nations? Five, four, three, two, one. And the answer is long term. Oh, oh, wow, 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 wow. What happened? What happened? What happened? Is it a good thing or not, not a good thing? Okay, okay. Calm down, calm down, calm down. Great. Long term shifts in the Earth's temperature and weather patterns. So they actually see the pattern from 30 years onwards. It's not like when it's raining or it's cold, doesn't mean climate change is not happening. All right. Next question. Oh, wait, let's see the scoreboard first. V! Congratulations. Where are you, V? Can you raise your hand? Somewhere? Oh, you're there. Good job. Which of the following is not an impact of climate change? Five, 
four, three, two, one. Yes, the rise of COVID. Oh my goodness, who puts rising sea levels? Didn't, didn't you listen to Prof. Charles' presentation just now? Huh? Are you... Oi! Sorry, the change. Oh, sorry, V kind of dropped, but Jove is next. Jove, where are you? Okay, I can't... Oh, 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 you're right there. Good job. Maintain, huh? All right, next question. Which of the following options accurately reflects the key focus areas of the V3 findings? Okay, you can kind of read properly. Five, four, three, two, one. Ooh, hey, not bad. It was not my script, but I actually made a point to mention all four points in my opening speech. So if you guys have listened and also listening to Prof. Charles' explanation. All right, let's see. Hey, Joe, you went down already. Jaden Shamin, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Don't pay say, don't pay say. All right, oh, behind there. Okay, good job. What is the main objective of the Singapore Green Plan? Oh, that's fast. Good job. Five, four, three, two, one. Advance our nation's sustainable development. Great job. Uh, two, one, eight of you. Some of you have chosen other. No, man, man, continue trying. All right, let's see. I'll score. Oh, okay, never mind. Which of the following is not a key pillar of the Singapore Green Plan? We have five. Oh, wow. That was quick. Five, four, three, two, one. Economic growth. So there's five pillars. Uh, resilient future, sustainable living, city in nature, energy reset, and green green finance. Oh my god, did I get it? Green economy, sorry. So yes, economic growth is not the right name for one of the pillars. Great job. Let's see next the scoreboard. <gasps> oh wow. Taylor Stiff? Is that oh interesting. GP, where are you? GP, where are you? GP? GP? Oh, oh, oh you're all the way at the back. All right, great job, great job. Okay, it looks like things are switching up real quick. What is the role of individuals in achieving the goals of the Singapore Green Plan? Last question. This should be a no-brainer. Actively participating in sustainable practices. Wow, the eight of you that choose the green colour one. Ah. What are you guys thinking? Hmm? <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, all three, peace, private, public and the people sector should all work together in order to have a whole of nation movement to achieve our sustainable uh, development goals and also achieve our long-term net zero emissions goal by 2050. So, 209 of you, congratulations. Let's see the scoreboard. Podium. W, where are you, W? Raise your hands. Hey, uh, Taylor Stiff, ooh. GP, congratulations. Great job. All right, W, where are you? Can you raise your hand also? W, you're there. Taylor Stiff. Taylor Stiff, you're here. You're, you're right. No, not you. Who's Taylor Stiff? Oh, Taylor Stiff. <laughs> you're here. And GP is all the way up there. So thank you everyone for participating in the Kahoot quiz. I hope you guys learned a thing or two about our sustainability initiatives, agendas, and what Singapore is working towards too. Congratulations to all of our top three winners. So after the event, please go to the CDL booth to collect your vouchers. $100. $70 and $50. Hope you guys are excited. All right.
I need to see it. Oh. All right. Okay. So later on for the conversation with DPN Heng Sui Kiet, uh, just want to remind everyone once again to keep your phones on silent mode. And also, if you guys have any questions, we will open the floor later on, uh, depending on our time constraints. So this conversation will focus on climate impacts in Singapore and how it's going to affect everyone's livelihood. It will be a conversation between Mr. Heng Sui Kiet and Dr. Winston Chow. And I hope you guys are very excited for it. So just in a while, Ms. Dr. Heng will be coming in and we will welcome him with open arms while on our seats. All right. Um, in the meantime... In the meantime, just wanted to share with you guys once again, because some of you have streamed in, some of you latecomers have streamed in, there will be a lot of uh, initiatives, sustainability initiatives coming up very soon in the month of March and also April. So, the CDL E-Generation Challenge is up again. So, this is the challenge that I participated and also um, won the chance to uh, be on this Antarctic trip, once in a lifetime trip. I'm not sure where it's going this year, huh? please. <laughs> Just, but you're going to go somewhere that you will experience and learn a lot from the people there. So, please stay tuned for its launch in the later half of the year. Especially if you're a youth, please join this challenge and just try our best. You never know what you might win. And also, we have the 14th CDL GCNS Young SDG Leaders Award. So especially if you're youths age 18 to 25, you can join with a group of friends and stand to win prizes of up to $10,000 to advance your sustainability initiative. Also, 23rd March will be International Women's Day as um, CDL will be holding a very interesting event that I will not show, but featuring six eco champions, champions, female eco champions. So stay tuned for that. And also, if you have not visited our Melting Ice Sinking Cities exhibition, please do visit it because it will close on the 25th of March at the Singapore Botanic Gardens. So you will actually see a lot of portraits taken by renowned photographers about the wildlife there that will be on display. There will be a lot of videos and a lot of signs information there on the state of things it is in Antarctica. Alright, East Coast Initiatives. Oh, please do follow CDL social at CDL underscore sustainability and also Facebook and LinkedIn. And for East Coast, just a show of hand, any of you live in East Coast? Oh, wow, you guys are very supportive. Even, oh, yes, Dr. Risa Ch the boy from Bordeaux, you're from East Coast. All right, so if you're interested to participate and volunteer your time also, or just to meet like-minded people and learn from the community there, you can, you can join and check out some of East Coast Green programs or check out their booths outside. Please scan the QR code to join and become a Green Ambassador so that you can actually have first-hand updates of all of these programs. Okay. Okay, so we have the prizes for the winners here because it has been sent right to me. And before we go on with the conversation, we'd like to invite the three winners to come out on stage because we need everyone to recognise you for your knowledge and your efforts here. So, may I invite a GP, Taylor, Steve, and W. Where are you guys? Please come out on stage. Everyone, please give a round of applause. They have worked hard. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Wait, which one's the Taylor Steve one? Ah? You. Ah, it's you. It don't pay say. Okay, so for third prize. Which one's that? Which one? Oh, okay. Take a photo of them alone. Wait, I'll give the prize first, ah. <laughs> In third place, we have W, right? All right, here is your fifty dollars vouchers. Go, me? No. <laughs> okay, later. Second prize, Taylor Steve. What's your real? You have a fan club already. Are you going to the concert? Uh, no. Oh no! Ah, okay, okay. Never mind. It's okay. And first prize, GP. Okay, you can please come to the middle to take a group photo. Please take, come to the center here. Is it here? Okay. okay. Ah, Mia also. Okay, okay.
All right. Good job. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our guests of honour will be arriving shortly for the next segment of the programme. The conversation with DPM Heng Sui Kiet and Dr. Winston Chow, moderated by Ms. Esther An. So everyone, please join me in welcoming our guest of honour, Deputy Prime Minister Heng Sui Kiet, who is also the Coordinating Minister for Economic Policies and the Grassroots Advisor for East Coast GRC Grassroots Organisation. Joining the conversation is the co-chair of the IPCC Working Group 2 and Professor of Urban Climate and Lee Kong Chien Research Fellow at Singapore Management University, Professor Winston Chow, who earlier shared his deep insight on the climate emergency. Moderating this session is CDL's Chief Sustainability Officer, Ms. Esther An, who was named in one, Time 100 Climate 2023, Time's inaugural list of the 100 most influential climate leaders in business, as well as named amongst 25 trailblazing women against climate change by Reuters, and was the first Singaporean to be conferred the SDG Pioneer for Green Infrastructure and a Low Carbon Economy by the UN Global Compact in 2018. So prior to this, we had crowdsourced some questions that we will weave into the discussion. If you have any additional questions to speak to for our speakers today, we will also open the floor to Q&A for Q&A later, depending on the time that we have left. So Ms. Esther An, over to you. Thank you very much and good afternoon on a Saturday. You know, you guys must be as passionate as all of us here. And uh, first, and thank you DPM for allowing us to have this uh, conversation. And of course, my buddy uh, uh, Winston is forever passionate. Yeah, so I think we have heard all the presentation. Our planet is not sustainable. If I may quote the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, we have entered an era of global boiling. The global warming era has ended last year. And uh, the, of course, the data shows that 2023 is actually the record high. For how many years? Just now, uh, uh, Dr. Chow say it's like hundreds, thousands of years. So, and uh, in fact, if you look back last eight years of history, every year you read news about this year is hotter than the last year for eight years in a row. So I already heard from some scientists that uh, 2024, if no action is taken, it is set to be even hotter than 2023. And we also heard about our own Singapore Climate Change Survey, which was released on the first week of, in the first week of January. And uh, that show how urgent it is when people just came back from year-end holiday, the focus is on climate change. So, and uh, we are really happy here that at East Coast, uh, all the residents here are very lucky. You are enjoying the longest shoreline, beautiful sea view, sea breeze and all that. But just now we heard about rising temperature and also uh, sea level rise, which is real. Okay, and uh, if we don't know about it, there's no action taken. That will be very dangerous. And on the global level, we are all talking about race to zero. That started in uh, Glasgow, COP26. We are now not just dealing with climate change, but it's a climate emergency. Emergency, take urgent and collective actions to mitigate it and also to take innovative action, adaptation is very, very important. So we have the green plan, 2030. I heard the quiz had very good result. Most of you know the green plan seems to be very, very well. And uh, today we are very, very happy to have two important speakers from the policy makers perspective and also from client uh, climate uh, science and educators' perspective, and from the business sector, we also know that we have a role to play because businesses can bridge, you know, uh, the international and the local community and uh, all ages as well. We don't just look at our goal as to maintain profitable, but we have to 
run a business that is viable, not at the expense of people and planet, a very healthy triple bottom line. So without further ado, I would like to you know, uh, start this conversation with DPM and also Winston. Basically, two big categories that I'm looking at is about awareness and action, and of course, impact as well. And, uh, DPM, thank you so much. I heard you have really many, many activities today, back to back. And thank you for joining us. And uh, so just now, um, before you arrive, we have actually quite a lot of presentation on how urgent in, uh, the climate is. And Singapore being next to the equator, the weather is not going to be cooler than before. In fact, it was uh, estimated that the temperature will continue to, to rise. And of course, when the temperature rise, a lot of usage of air conditioning, energy consumption, carbon footprint will continue to grow as well. So we all know that the world is targeting a net zero. And Singapore has also pledged to a net zero by 2050. So the Green Plan 2030 cover five pillars, yeah, including a city in nature and, uh, of course, you know, uh, energy reset, sustainable living, and resilient economy, and also a green future. So all these have an impact on everyone here, whether you are public, private, or business sector. So at your level, DPM, you can definitely drive change at the policymaker level, and also you are very passionate in engaging the grassroots. Can you share with us that, do you think the awareness of the green plan is good enough? Or is there any particular pillar you think you would like to push more and, uh, in your capacity as DPM as well as, you know, with your passion in East Coast? Well, uh, thanks, Esther. And let me uh, thank uh, also Esther for organizing this event and bringing Winston and all of you here in our discussion. And I also want to like to thank uh, uh, Principal Tagreed for allowing us to use this uh, IT now, we are in a very special uh, campus because it is one of our Platinum Green Mark super low energy building in Singapore. So, congratulations, uh, Tiving. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, the IT students should be, will be very happy with this. Huh? Now, uh, before I, I talk about that, I should uh, mention how we end up coming here for this event. It, let me ask, do a quick survey. How many of you have been to the CDL gallery at the Botanic Gardens? Oh, not bad, quite, quite a number. Yeah. And uh, some of you have not put up your hand yet. I hope the next time I see you, I ask a question, everybody will put up your hand. And the reason, the reason why I mention that is that there is uh, um, the CDL gallery at the Botanic Gardens have been hosting a whole series of very interesting exhibitions. And it so happened that one day I visited it and I saw this, uh, this, this was, the exhibition is called Melting Ice Sinking City. So I said, oh, Sinking City, oh, this is so urgent, I must go and take a look. So when I went in and took a look, I saw that all the activities I was doing and I saw this very fierce lady talking about why you must act. And that was, of course, Esther. So I, I then said we should uh, bring uh, whatever that you are doing. And also, you have a very interesting championship program the, for the youth. Yeah. Maybe, Esther, before I answer the question and before I forget, maybe I should ask you to talk a little bit about that. Because I see so many youth here. Challenge them. Come. Oh, okay. <laughs> Master panelist. Shooting back the arrow, yeah, I think just now before you arrive, we actually show a video that MJ produced that uh, on our Ant Antarctic climate expedition. So MJ was actually our CDLE generation challenge a couple of years ago. So we actually supported her and uh, we joined the scientists led by the 88 years old Dr. Sylvia Earle, who was actually time hero the first woman, you know, time hero. And uh, at 88 years old, she's still doing deep sea diving and research. So as a business sector person, I went there to learn and also to 
you know, bring back the information and learning. And that's why I staged this, uh, you know, with CDLs and uh, all the management, all the team support, and we staged this melting ice exhibition. And I think that is something that we hope that everyone will enjoy the exhibition and also see the beautiful pictures of what is remaining in Antarctica. And just now, uh, I talk about global warming and boiling. And in fact, uh, the Arctic and Antarctic ice sheet extent has reached a lowest record low. So the polar region, whether North Pole or South Pole, have not been spared from global warming. So that is something that we all should be worried about. And that was also why, as a private sector company, we actually invest in you know, education. Because when we talk about net zero building, green building, a lot of people may not know what make a green building. So we actually build this net zero green gallery in 2013, actually, that was 11 years already, and uh, we are yeah, way ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we we really uh, are honoured to have the space from National Park Board. Yes, for us to you know to partners together to stage many exhibitions, whether it's about um, you know the botany, the greenery, and uh, even like Malay herbs and a lot. So we actually staged three climate exhibitions. This is the third one. Yeah. So well, there will be more coming, and uh, hopefully, and uh, some of you may have also taken part at uh, our youth uh, uh, event, such as the Generation Challenge, which we are going to talk a little bit more, and also the SDG Young Leaders Award as well. And uh, there will be more coming up at our Singapore uh, Sustainability Academy on the roof garden of City Square Mall. And uh, we, will, we will inform you more and follow the CDL uh, Instagram and also, you know, uh, connect on LinkedIn. Yeah, I think I will have to hand back to, <laughs> to DPM already. Yeah. Thank no, you, DPM. Thanks, uh, Esther. But that's a very good start. And the reason why I'm asking Esther to talk about this is I think the because Esther asked me a question about is, is awareness enough? So let me say that first, uh, awareness has improved you know, since we talk about the Singapore Green Plan and awareness has also uh, increased quite a bit because of recent adverse weather events all around the world. Uh, I think uh, earlier on, Winston, we have spoken about the, you know, the greater incidence of heat waves as well as uh, you know, rain uh, during this time of the year. We had very adverse and unusual weather patterns. So I think people are beginning to realise that all these events are going to affect us. And there's another aspect which we have probably will not know the full consequence of, which is how climate change is affecting the global biosphere, the global ecosystem, and in turn how that changes life you know, on Earth that you affect not just human beings, but all life on Earth. And I mean, I, one of the interesting exhibits in the CDL uh, gallery about melting ice is also about how climate change affects the ocean and in turn, how it affects life in the ocean. And when it affects life in the ocean, it has a huge effect on life all around us because the ocean is a very important part of the global ecosystem. Now, to the question, so awareness has certainly uh, improved, but your question is, is awareness good enough? And I would say, no, awareness will never be enough, right? Because if we know something, the question is, do we do something? Right? You've got to do something in order to turn that awareness into action. And the key question for us is, what are the actions that has been taken, that will be taken, and importantly, what each and every one of us can do. And we can go through, uh, as part of this, uh, the five pillars of the Singapore Green Plan, what are some of the key things that has been done by the government, by the private sector, uh, by the uh, academia, and in the research work. We can touch on each of this uh, in the coming minutes. Yeah. But I thought I'll, I'll just stop there first on awareness is certainly not enough and what we must do is to turn awareness, turn that knowledge into action. What can we do, each and every one of us, to combat climate change and to build a better world? 
That's wonderful. Well, when you talk about building awareness, I think most important, you know, task will go to educator. Yeah, so uh, Winston, you've been a very passionate educator for many years, and uh, climate science is a very mind-boggling subject. Not every man in the street will want to know or can understand what you are talking about, honestly. So how do you make climate science more, you know, user-friendly or public-friendly that even uncle, auntie can understand or children can understand? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Esther. Uh, it's, it's easy to get lost in just the maze or the plethora of numbers that is associated with climate change. And part of the things that I try to do and my colleagues, be it in, you know, in, the, in, in SMU or any other universities around the region and the world, is to translate and communicate that well. So we, it's a problem that we face, uh, translating a lot of issues, the complexities of climate change into something that is relatable to the person on the street. In, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm co-chairing the working group that looks into impacts, and that is the most local aspect of climate change. The, the How we cause climate change is more global in nature. I mentioned that in terms of emissions of greenhouse gases and urbanization, but how it translates to how a person in the East Coast or anywhere else in Singapore relates to it, that is the challenge of making that real, making uh, manifesting that real. And I share DPM's uh, um, you know, concern. Knowing or awareness is one thing, translating that into proper action is another. And making it local is also the best way forward in getting that action into place. So in my classes, I point out, we can't just stick to siloed ways of learning. It's great to have a, a fundamental understanding of science, of the humanities, of, uh, of engineering, of business, and so on and so forth. But the challenge of having action on climate change is that it's integrative, it's interdisciplinary, it's, it's cross sectors, it's cross regions. How we actually get the best action out there is that it requires somebody to be familiar and adept in going across these sort of fields. And one of the nice things in, in the education sphere in Singapore and increasingly around the world is the focus towards these sort of integration of aspects. Uh, so the solutions, to be frank, the solutions to climate change are as old as, you know, as, as time. We know what to do in terms of reducing emissions. The technologies, the, the processes for transitioning towards renewable energy or the, the, the solutions that we have for protecting our coast using a combination of old engineering that the Dutch have done in terms of you know, protecting their, sea line, uh, their, their coastlines with polders or with seawalls together with uh, you know, nature-based solutions that will be part of the Long Island. Um, we know the science behind that well, but how do we enable that? That requires action from government, action from the private sector, Esther, which you have done to a great degree, and also from the bottom up, from the communities, and that's where educators not just in the universities, but also at JC level, high school level, at secondary school level, or even primary school level, getting that awareness that climate change is not a siloed subject, but it cuts across all subjects, all disciplines, all aspects. That's a great step and a great enabler towards getting that action that we need to do moving forward. Indeed, actually, uh, well, 20 years ago, we actually worked with some schools and all that under the schools and corporate partnership, but it was actually terminated because, the, well, for a mix of reasons. And as a parent, I still remember during my kids' time, that was like almost 15, 20 years ago in the secondary school, and they said, nobody wants to join Green Club because it doesn't win medals for the school. It's not popular, you know? So, uh, like... Okay, <laughs> but actually that was really the reality. But I think time has changed and uh, I hope that, you know, the education, you know, um, system has also provided, uh, you know, give priority to learning about saving the planet, saving the people on the planet. So Green Club, it should not be a loser's club, it should be a winner's club, right? So, uh, rising sea level just now, uh, uh, Winston, you showed the two picture of the, uh, the East Coast, the beach, right? Seems like the beach is shrinking, right? Reducing and all that. So, let's come a little bit closer to East Coast, that the awareness of rising sea level, you know, is it quite common among residents in the East Coast area? 
UPM. Yeah. Well, I would say that it, it varies. I think there are, there are some there are some of our residents who are quite concerned, and in particular, uh, after we announced the Long Island plan, there were a lot of questions about well, what are we going to do and why why are we going to do this. So I think that the awareness has certainly increased a lot in the East Coast after the announcement of the Long Island plan. And in the work that we are doing on getting the community to uh, plant more trees, you know, Minister Desmond Lee announced a one million trees program. And we are now over 600,000 trees already. It's one million tree by 2030, but we are now over 600,000. So that is a plus. Uh, I, I've done a few of these tree planting events with our family, with our residents. And it's lovely to see parents with bringing their kids to plant. And, and Parks has done a great job in having a QR code that you can scan. You can scan the details of the tree and also put in your names. So I see many families feeling so proud that the whole family is uh, contributing to this effort. And I told the young people who are there, I mean, maybe 10, 12 years old, I said, well, look, you know, in 10 years' time, you'll see this tree will be far, far taller than you. And you will feel proud that you have added something to this neighbourhood uh, to add to the, uh, this tree planting movement. But importantly, in building an even better uh, ecosystem for Singapore. So yes, I would say yes, in East Coast, because of some of this, many of these activities, and specifically on the recycling, there's a lot of interest in uh, recycling. And I, many of the grassroots organise many good events to promote that recycling. So in terms of reducing waste, cutting waste, uh, undertaking green activities, knowing a bit more about what is happening for the, uh, the uh, Long Island project, there's a lot of interest now. Yeah, well, the Long Island projects is amazing, right? It's really, I heard from uh, Professor Kuting Chai that the idea was mooted more than 30 years ago. And uh, now with, of course, more advanced technology, you know, architectural uh, solutions and all that, that is something that we can really look forward to. And uh, East Coast boy, the dog boy, yes. what is your <laughs> thoughts about, you know, Long Island? What do you think you would like to see that it will really impact on people's uh, you know, lifestyle and all that. But mind you, it will take quite a m number of years before Long Island can you know, really be completed. So during you know, these years, you know, how can we help and engage residents within East Coast or outside to really support this? And how can we support this Long Island project? Uh, east side, best side. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> grew up here. I mean, I grew up here, <laughs> late parking a lot. Um, my my secondary school. I will not name what it is, but those of you who know me well enough, uh, protest and revolt. That's one place. Uh, spent a lot of time by the coast. Spent a lot of time with very, uh, having a very relaxed lifestyle because you know we, we chill. We 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 are we get in close contact with the sea, with nature. Also, as I pointed out, a lot of the best makan is here in the east side, lah. Uh, getting that familiarity with nature is, a, I would argue, is an important value that we have. We are a city state. A lot of times, when I go overseas in, in conferences and all, they make they make fun of the fact that uh, you are not really a you're a city boy. You're not in touch with nature. I disagree with that, by the way. So, how we can? I mean, I would like to see you know my my kids and my 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 nephews and nieces enjoy the, the sort of uh, uh, nice close relationship we have with the coast, nice close relationship we have with nature in Singapore. Uh, we've moved from a, you know, a garden city towards a city in nature philosophy. We want to bring the idea of our natural heritage in terms of our uh, tropical rainforest, our marine ecosystems front and centre together with that urbanisation process. It's something to value and something to treasure. And also the best science looking into how the bringing nature back into the discussion also has a massive impact in terms of climate adaptation, protecting the coastlines, 
and as well as climate mitigation in terms of sequestering carbon or preventing erosion from, uh, from, from sea level rise or from warmer temperatures by regulating that, the, the heat island that I mentioned as well. Uh, maintaining that awareness, bringing that into the lifestyles of people in the future uh, through um, the Long Island Plan, for instance, having that public spaces available to people who understand that uh, we should not exclude but include nature into our lives. That, I think, is a very fundamental approach uh, enabling a climate-resilient future. And let me just also add that it's not just local to Singapore. A lot of other city-states around the world, they are paying attention to what goes on here. Uh, it's something that um, I'm justifiably proud of to see the actions taking place in Singapore that other city-states and other countries are saying, hey, if it works in Singapore, can it work in our coastal city? Can it work in our particular context as well? So that, I think, is, uh, is a good attention, a good way to feel like um, what we do here isn't just restricted to Singapore alone. It will have ramifications, positive ramifications elsewhere. DPM, you want to yeah, add? I am very struck by the comments that Winston made, which is about how, you know, in your younger days, you enjoy this, uh, the, the lifestyle in Bordeaux. I think the, you had a slide earlier on about, was that you playing in the, on the beach? That was me, the, the picture just... Uh, ah, the picture. That was me playing with my grandma in yeah, ah, the early okay. 1980s. Okay, so, so, that, so that's very important. I think it is very important for all of us to not just look at this as a kind of abstract theoretical issue, but how we feel about nature is going to decide whether we are going to do something. If we don't value nature, we don't value all this, we don't value the sea, then you're going to say, well, what's a big deal? You know, anyway, I'm just sitting in my uh, school, sitting at home, turning on the aircon, I just enjoy myself. But if you do enjoy nature, you, you have a deeper appreciation of that. And you can see for yourselves how that is uh, changing. Early on, you met our MCs, our MJ bio girl, right? Yeah. And is she still around? Yes, MJ, you are still around. <laughs> Did you <laughs> want to? Yes. So, <laughs> so MJ, uh, we did uh, one of the activities together with a whole group of uh, young people in uh, Pulau Ubin, in the Chek Jawa area. And she is extremely passionate about all this. I think for those younger people among here, us here, the, you'll be useful to see her video on all this, the nature and about science and about uh, you know, life, you know, all the bio, how the biosphere is uh, changing and how we can value it. So I think that appreciation is going to be very important. And for all of us living in Singapore, the one thing which we must be very grateful for is how many trees there are in Singapore and how much of the, the space we have for a city you know, to have such a large extent of green cover. And a lot of that credit must go to one person, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. You know, he is the ultimate greenie before the term was even invented. And uh, I'll just share with you a, a very funny story. Years ago when I was working for him, we went on a long overseas trip. and. After the trip, we came back. I said, wow, my goodness, it's such a long trip. I'm so tired, I'm going to go home. So uh, I, I went home. The moment I reached home, I got a call from his secretary. And Mr. Lee's secretary said, I said, I don't want to go to office to read the message. Can, if it's not secret, read to me. <laughs> he said, it's not secret, I'll just read to you. And Mr. Lee said, the rain tree next to lamppost number da da da, after we get out of the airport, is sick. Huh? I said, I also went through the same road and I didn't see a sick tree. So I immediately called up National Parks and I said, hey, Mr. Lee said the rain tree is sick. So they then uh, got the M Parks to check. 
And it turned out that, my goodness, the tree is sick. So I said, oh, don't worry, tell Mr. Lee we are on it and we will, we, we will deal with this uh, sick tree. And uh, Winston mentioned about people looking at you know, what works in Singapore and how we can uh, learn and how that could be valuable. So, uh, so during that trip that I mentioned, a long trip, we were in America and he was in a campus, like a campus like this, in this facility, having a conference. And then he noticed a very nice tree. So he said, he, he said to me, he said, check whether that tree can be grown in Singapore. So in those days, there were no handphone, nothing. I said, actually, I don't know what that tree is. How, how do I check whether that tree can grow in Singapore? So I asked the university people, I said, hey, what, what is that tree? So I took down this complicated Latin name, right? then came back and asked National Parks, can you all check whether that tree can be grown in Singapore? Then they came back very quickly and said, no, unfortunately, no. It's a lovely tree, but it's a temperate country tree. It cannot survive in a tropical climate. So I had to report to Mr. Lee that. But if you look at the green cover in Singapore, you look at what we are enjoying, a lot of it stems from Mr. Lee's belief that a city cannot be a concrete jungle. A city that is a concrete jungle will not have a soul. Uh, and uh, he had commented on other cities and so on. And he has been so observant that if you notice that uh, he was very fascinated on how Paris, for example, had tree on the, on the boulevards, on the sidewalks. And an important part of it is that they also, even as they pave the roads, they have the pavements, it is not completely paved you notice that there are like a square metal grid that, so that that portion is not paved, you have soil, and so that rainwater can get to the tree, the tree can breathe, and the tree can survive. And that's why you see these trees. So in fact, you see that in many parts of Singapore, uh, whether it's in the HDB estates or in the private estates, we have very careful um, planning for these plantings right, of all these trees. And that has helped a lot to build this awareness of nature in a city. And in fact, one very interesting project which uh, Professor Ko Teng Chai has been involved in is the Blue Green Project. You know, the uh, uh, parks at the, uh, the Bishan Park, yeah? where instead of turning a canal, you know, instead of and just building a solid rock wall of a canal, it is in turn into a nice uh, small stream and the stream flows through it so the water is blue but along it is the coast and the coast has been very nicely done and there's another project next to Kotek Pat Hospital you know, where the land was again repurposed to look at something that's much more uh, you know, much more in tune with nature, much more beautiful so I think it's something which in Singapore uh, we need to treasure. We need to treasure nature. We need to treasure what we have around us. And in fact, there's a lot of research now going on about therapeutic gardening. How gardening, uh, doing green things, has very useful value for our human health. You know, and this whole idea of biophilic designs and so on. So apart from sort of taking care of the climate, taking care of life on Earth, uh, is also ultimately good for humans, right? good for our soul, good for our sense of well-being, good for our mood and, and our health and so on. So I hope that all of you leave this room feeling that, okay, let's, let's look, look around uh, ITE is, look around this building. And in fact, we did some tree planting here as well. Uh, on the, what are the beautiful things that you can enjoy in the campus? What are beautiful things that you can enjoy in our neighbourhood? and make an effort to do more of that. And then go and enjoy the river, enjoy the sea. Uh, for those of you, uh, come and enjoy Pulau Ubin. It's one of the last uh, you know, lovely islands and we intend to keep it very rustic. So it's something that you can come and enjoy and it's really a very good uh, recreation. So, so I think we should try and do more of this to a, 
appreciate that nature and what nature can do for us. And Winston mentioned about national parks, talking about garden city into a city in nature. So Singapore has been a garden city, but now we are trying to bring nature into the city. And if you look at our, those of you, you know, all of us travel along Singapore, you'll notice that one very recent change which National Parks has done is that along the highways, along our even HDB roads in the HDB estates, it's no longer just tree and grass. It is tree and many different layers of plants and flowers because that is, I was very surprised. So when I was finance minister, I'm very careful about spending, right? So I asked, I said, how much more money is N Park spending to uh, keep the garden so flowery and to keep the road so flowery? I was very surprised and I learned something very new. Actually, we are spending less because when you have just trees and grass, you have to cut the grass all the time. If you mimic nature and make it look more like nature, we actually don't have to maintain it as, uh, as regularly because it will grow its own and it has got its own ecosystem. And it, looks, it not only looks nicer, but it's actually even more uh, efficient in terms of our public spending to maintain the garden. So I, I would say that I would encourage all our, uh, everybody to think about, is there a good solution that can do both? Yeah, in fact, if from a business perspective, embracing nature and sustainability also, you know, uh, make business sense and make economic sense. And uh, well, the green plan, actually, we are creating almost 50 over 1,000 green jobs for young people. So for those who are into sustainability and uh, you have very good prospect in your career, okay? So, and <laughs> yeah, well, and also because of the green coverage, you know, for Singapore, I mean, when we interact with, you know, overseas, you know, green building sector people, uh, our Singapore brand is very strong in terms of the greenery and all. And uh, in fact, it does help to attract a lot of investments and also foreign talents and others to come in to invest in Singapore and uh, just imagine if the country if this, the country is getting hotter and hotter and there's no mitigations and uh, lack of greenery uh, I think we will lose a lot of investment and uh, it will affect the land cost and building costs also that's very important for us as developer and landlord but I think joke aside um, uh, nature is not just about you know planting trees there's more to it and uh, in fact last year we held an uh, youth event with uh, it's called ACI uh, a youth summit uh, comprises of like you know hundreds of people from ASEAN China and India very ambitious youth summit and in fact before the summit we did a raw poll one delegate one worry on the top of their mind so there was like you know there was climate change there was poverty unemployment but the top vote was actually mental well-being. So we were very worried because all these are young people from 17 to 35 years old. And uh, if, you know, the climate future, the prospect, the climate, you know, emergency affect them, mental well-being. And I'm sure we heard of climate anxiety. Um, you all, you know, both have like an interaction with a lot of young people. Climate anxiety is real and some young people don't want to get married or they get married, they don't want to have children. And as parents, what would you, you know, give advice to the young people here, DPM? My advice to young people here about, well, certainly they should get married and have children. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think to Esther's point about better, are you worried about your future? Are you? I hear, yes, I hear people nodding your head. Now, just now we said that awareness is one thing, right? We must always turn awareness into action. So I'm very glad that you are aware of, you know, there, are, there will always be challenges ahead. One of the challenges that we need to deal with is climate change. Now, then the next thing is turn awareness into action. What is it that you can do about it? So my... My suggestion will be that there's, there are lots and lots of things that young people uh, can do. So let me first start with uh, what 
you can do personally to do something about climate change. So uh, our MSE in the Ministry of Sustainability and Environment have actually, uh, I don't know whether you all have heard of their one, two, three plan. For, yeah. So in order to make it easy to remember, they said, well, one is the aircon, don't make it so cold, so make it one degree warmer, so one. Then two is to shower two minutes less every day, so you can save lots of water. Don't waste water, right? Three is to uh, observe the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. And I see a lot of young people particularly doing the third one, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. So there are practical things that you can do, number one. Number two, uh, Esther mentioned about green jobs. And indeed, there are, uh, it is one of the areas that we would want to grow in the economy because A, it is something which will be in demand and, and second, it is uh, something responsible for us to do. So let me talk about the range of green jobs that we can look forward to. Yeah. Now, the Monetary Authority of Singapore MAS has been doing a lot of work on uh, green finance. So there is a lot of interest now amongst companies to use uh, green finance, green bond. And in fact, when I was finance minister, uh, we did two things to promote this greening. The first is uh, a carbon tax. Now, nobody likes more taxes, but the carbon tax is a slightly different one. We want to encourage, we want to have a send a price signal. And the carbon tax revenue doesn't come to the government for spending. It actually comes and put into a fund where we uh, go, bring it back to the private sector. And nationally, we have different uh, sets of projects that these are some of the projects that has got the best cost benefit and we're going to work with companies to flow that fund you know, on their application that we would want to work with the companies to reduce their, their carbon footprint, to increase the energy efficiency and so on. And that is uh, starting this year because we have collected a, we're collecting the taxes and so we're waiting for companies to kind of talk about what is it that they can do uh, to reduce the carbon footprint. And that's the first thing, right? Now, on the sort of green growth area, so to speak, there's a lot of uh, work in this. I have uh, visited companies that are doing very, very good recycling work. I have visited companies that are looking at photovoltaic cells. I have visited companies in Singapore that are doing uh, batteries. Because if you have, say, solar energy, solar energy, in, for it to be portable, you need to have a storage system. So there's a Singapore company that produces uh, electric battery, produces battery. And if the batteries can be charged at places where there is near, you know, where there's hydropower or solar panel and so on, that, bet that energy becomes portable, you can use it. And he has got this, uh, solar power cell for a battery powered uh, motor scooters and he has a, quite a nice market share now in one of the provinces in China so there's a lot of interest in technologies like this on the green uh, energy there's also a lot of work that we can do on the R&D front so I visited research uh, bodies in NTU in NUS using a combination of new materials that you can coat onto solar panels. And if you can coat the materials on the solar panel, the solar panel has much higher efficiency. So whether your interest is in doing something directly, you know, like I'm going to start to go and install solar panels, or I'm going to do this, or that, even in your own personal habit, there's a lot you can do. That if your interest is that I want to go and do a business in this area, there's a lot of green business that will be growing in the coming years. And uh, finally, if your interest is to do R&D, you can also do work relating to R&D on the green area, whether it's new materials, whether it's new ways of harvesting solar power, uh, and, and so on. 
And the last area we shall, be, uh, we shall mention is, any of you working in the finance sector? Any of that? Yes. So MES has been promoting a lot of uh, green finance, and we have, we're, we're issuing green bond. There's a lot of interest in green finance. And green finance will be very useful, even for buildings. Uh, Esther mentioned about the platinum uh, green mark, right? and I mentioned about ITE East being a platinum green mark building, super uh, low energy. Uh, now, the, how do we channel finance to fund projects like this it will be very, very important. And the more we can do this, uh, the more, many more companies will adopt this. And the Platinum Green Mark, by the way, I, I met a banker from uh, Germany recently, and he told me two things. First, many of the European companies, their consumers will look at what kind of building are, is your office? Is your office in a Platinum Green Mark building? So I, I was quite surprised. So I asked one of the property uh, agents in Singapore. I said, is it true that European companies will pay more to go into a platinum green mark building? And they said, yes. There are some companies who insist that I will only go to a platinum green mark building because they, they are monitoring their carbon footprint. So they have to do their scope one, scope two, scope three reporting, and they will do that. And the uh, MES and SGX has also required reporting by listed companies as well as by uh, big lead, as it moved by uh, bigger companies, even if they are not listed. So all these measures will mean that if you are a company, you need to do something. But one reason why we are putting emphasis on the private sector is that the private sector can do a lot. You know, and we must support and incentivize the private sector to do that, to create green jobs, to take action to do to be more green and to train our young people for that. Esther mentioned about your sustainability academy, right? And ITE is ITE also has a lots of programs. Our IHLs have lots of programs. SMU, NUS, and all our universities have all good programs on, on this. So I would say that for our young people, you should not feel pessimistic. If I were you, I would if I'm as young as you, I'll feel very happy and optimistic that, you know, in the old days, we are all so poor, uh, in the internet was not invented, you want to learn anything, you, it's only textbooks, and uh, if you're lucky enough, a good teacher. But today, for our young people, you can learn so many things on your own, you can go onto the internet, you can go on YouTube, you can go and uh, hear all these interesting debates and comments, and then you can do so many things to take action. So I say, don't just uh, worry. If you worry about something, join us, do something. And whatever that you like to do, let us know, and then we would organize it and see whether from the, whether it's with companies, whether it's with our academic institutions or research bodies, yeah. join in the effort to do something. Well, definitely, well actually, we have some uh, young people here from the Singapore Youth, uh, uh, Climate Alliance, right? They just have an event this morning at our academy. So we actually do and uh, interact with a lot of young people. And just two nights ago, uh, Robin is here, Eco Business. They have an A-list every year to actually recognize uh, Eco Champions in the, the adult or the youth as well. So we have quite a few young leaders here, including MJ was a recipient and uh, Yours, uh, your mentee also is, uh, yeah. So I think, um, uh, Winston, we were at COP together and we were interacting, you know, with a lot of young people. And uh, let's give a little bit of, you know, a bit, not to it, you know. Yes, it's scary, <laughs> but there's always hope. So what is your, you know, your take when you interact with so many of your students and even alumni, you know, they all look to you as the big brother. And uh, well, people like, like, you know, the influencer, like MJ has outreached to almost like half a million, you know, uh, audience through her keep, Just Keep Thinking channel. 
and uh, well, we have LinkedIn, we have social media, we have every you know many media that now we can voice our opinion and our mm. thoughts and uh, connect with people from different parts of the world as well. So, what do you think, you know, as an uh, academic and also as a really passionate, you know, old hand in this, young at heart as well? <laughs> young at heart is the word there, not an old hand just yet. <laughs> Uh, but to follow on to what DBM Heng said, uh, the excellent points that you raised uh, about translating anxiety into action. And by the way, anxiety is real for youths, um, uh, not just in Singapore, but elsewhere. Uh, I, I went to Japan last November to give a talk and I'll be going to Japan again this month uh, to, for a climate workshop. And one of the things there, apart from uh, issues about impacts on health uh, for the aging populations in Japan and in Singapore as well from, from climate change, which I touched upon in my talk, there's also that big stress on anxiety, climate anxiety for youths. It's a very common theme across a lot of Asian cities here. Uh, but how the challenge is to translate that anxiety into what can you, you know, tangible action. And I would say that there are three ways to do so. One is know that there is still a future for jobs that can contribute towards climate resilience. Esther is right, green jobs are the future. Uh, as part of my work in SMU, I've been looking into green data centers and in this case, financing green data centers. And I've been interviewing quite a lot of people there. And one common thread, and I can, without revealing this, this interviewee, they said that, you know, I'm very lucky to be working in the green sector because I have job security until 2050. And that's something, so if you're young and you're looking out for a, a good opportunity to have a long-term future, aim towards that. That's one. Two, um, how we build, okay, so I'm anxious because I have a 12-year-old who's taking PSLE this year. And how I deal with that anxiety, how we, we, we try and have support networks with our friends and as parents to try and uh, deal with the anxiety. Similarly, if you have climate anxiety, there's a wealth of good communities from the ground up that uh, can, can, try, can, can help keep a support network or look out for opportunities in that sense. Uh, Singapore is quite blessed to have that. And in, in that sense also, it's quite inspiring for the young at heart or the old people like myself and Esther <laughs> uh, to learn from these communities. So apart from MJ, uh, a, a few nights ago, there was the Eco Business uh, Award winners for the a uh, One of my uh, employees is here. I see him at the back, uh, Xiang Tian, Le Park in Singapore. Uh, he works for me as a research associate for the Cooling Singapore Project. And I, I mean, he, the way that he, he, he leads in terms of building that community is something that uh, we that i actually draw inspiration from uh, similarly i also learn from the students i mentor one of my uh, students in, in smu he's actually a founder uh, for a startup uh, a sort of a, a sustainability startup looking into biodegradable batteries and trying to upscale that for singapore and the region the energy that they have in terms of putting their, you know, putting thoughts into action for climate resilience uh, actually is an inspiring example for everyone, regardless of age or, or any sort of uh, level that you're at. And it's something, it's a good lesson. So that's why in this field, on, in sustainability, we learn from everybody else. The community is large and broad and there's no, you know, um, sort of hierarchy in that sense. We pay attention to what works. And lastly, there's still a lot of research ongoing in, um, in all the universities in Singapore and the regions towards building new knowledge bases to help with climate action. Uh, BBM Heng mentioned the three R's, but in, uh, in the urban systems, in IPCC, there's also the uh, ASI approach in terms of climate mitigation. We avoid emissions, we shift emissions, and we improve upon how we emit you know, greenhouse gases, ASI. For instance, uh, for the transportation sector, we can avoid emissions by working from home. We don't commute to work or we reduce our commutes, and it can make a discernible impact in terms of how much, uh, you know, uh, how much we burn petrol and emit uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We could shift the way we, we do that. So by moving from private transport to public transportation, in which Singapore and as well as other Southeast Asian cities are increasing or improving 
their public transportation infrastructure to this end. And lastly, you can have the I. So you've got avoid, shift, and the last one, I. We can move from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles, which is what Singapore is doing by 2040. Uh, so the net combination of these approaches, instead of the three R's, you have ASI, that makes a discernible dent towards our own territorial emissions, and it can help with climate mitigation. These sort of uh, broad ideas require local research. If you're young, if you're curious about climate change and you want to apply that curiosity into research, trust me, there's a lot of uh, research labs in Singapore who welcome your involvement uh, to help bring this research forward uh, in the Singapore context as well. Well, I just want to share the real business case that just now uh, DPM mentioned about Green Bond. In fact, CDL launched the first Green Bond in Singapore in 2017. And uh, the year before we launched it in April 2017, I actually met seven or eight banks. None of them, you know, in local banks especially, were very excited about it. And uh, most of the banks that who are willing to look at green bond and green loan with us were actually all foreign banks. But look at it today. The banks, you know, green finance is uh, mainstream, you know. And uh, for us, it helped us to also get better access to financing. Every business needs to grow with financial support. And uh, also, you know, some will come with even better, you know, interest rates as well. So, whichever area that you are studying, whether it's the technology, economic, you know, accountancy, technology or whatever, there's always a role for you to play. Just now we talk about Sustainability reporting, which is a huge agenda. And uh, if you want to know more, yeah, contact me later on because we actually I chair a sustainability reporting advisory for Singapore. And our ambition is not just for listed companies to do reporting, but for non-listed company also. So all these are real, you know, prospects that you could look at. And, uh, but of course, we also want to, you know, look at it, you know, from on both sides as well, uh, 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 DPM. Singapore is an aging population. We talk a lot about youth, okay? And uh, of course, like, you know, how can we also engage cross-generation? You know, saving the planet is not just for the young people, but also for the, you know, the adults and also even the grannies and all. How can we have partnership that cut across different age group, different sectors. And I think people live longer today, you know, and if someone retire at 60 or even, you know, even 65, if, you know, you live until 80, 90, you still have a good 20, 30 years, you know, to, to, to spend. How do we, how would you suggest that? Is there any partnerships or any ideas that we want to tap on to have like, to tap onto the wisdom of the mature or older people and to tap onto the energy of the younger people? Well, I, I, start, I think the question you asked is a very important one in that everyone has a part to play, so it's not just the young or, or the old or the middle age. So each of us can, can do something. The question is, what, what is it that the seniors can do? I would say the seniors can do practically everything that a young person can do. I have, uh, for instance, we do a beach uh, cleaning project and there are seniors who join us, I mean older people who join us. Uh, I would regard myself as a senior because under our, and, and parks, under our, um, many of the concession, I found that I, I now qualify for senior citizens concession. <laughs> if I go and take a bus or if I go and take, if I go and visit the botanic gardens, in the orchid gardens, I have to pay, I can uh, get the seniors' concession. So when I was doing this uh, activity, there was a lot of these seniors who took part. So I'll say first, as, as a senior myself, you know, I, I will do my part. Now, what is it that uh, seniors can do? I'll say first, uh, many of the seniors, people of my age group, right, who grew up in Singapore before Singapore was even an independent nation, grew up in times of great uh, poverty and hardship. And I noticed that many of our seniors are actually very frugal. So whether the way they spend and so on, uh, the kind of things that they do. I think in, a, in the old days, I think the older one among us will know that we never waste food. If you have any spare food, you, know, you cannot finish the night before, the next day it becomes recycled 
but it's recycled not just into the rubbish bin, it's recycled and recooked for some other the dishes. And in particular, Chinese New Year is coming. I remember eating so many recycled dishes after many days of Chinese New Year because any food that cannot be consumed is recooked in very interesting ways. So I'll say that there's a lot of wisdom there about how uh, we can deal with that. And two, we also have many uh, seniors who have just retired or retiring. And there's a wealth of expertise that we can tap on to get them to uh, do the projects which are very much related to the green causes. And many of them uh, do look at this a lot more seriously because they have lots of experience, particularly those who have been working in companies, working in uh, government institutions, working in academia. I mean, there's no reason for us to say, you know, when you are at the age of whatever, 60, 65, you retire, you just go and play golf, or you just go and uh, uh, stay at home and do nothing. And that wisdom can be tapped. So I mentioned about turning the uh, anxiety of youth into action. We should also turn the anxiety and the knowledge and the expertise of uh, uh, seniors into action. What is it that each of them can contribute? And there's a lot of uh, wisdom that we can uh, tap on, on how we can uh, take specific action uh, to deal with that. Then, of course, when it comes to uh, even whether it's saving resources, you know, there's a lot of things that they, they, we could do to uh, enhance the efficient use of these resources. And some of the companies I visited, for example, are led by uh, second generation leaders. I've seen quite a number of companies where the seniors stay on in the company as advisor. They don't impede the young people from coming with new ideas. But I noticed that the, some of the young people are very good at tapping on the seniors and say, Look, you have done this before. Is there a better way? And of course, the seniors are quite happy to contribute. And I've seen companies where very good designs have been done with these uh, ideas uh, because the seniors say, look, I've seen 30, 40 years of ups and downs. So if you want to do this, you've got to bear this in mind. So when you apply that to now new challenges, I think there's a lot we can tap on. So where, wherever they may be working at, in, in the past, whatever their life experiences, uh, whatever their personal habits, there's a lot that we can uh, tap on. Yeah, wonderful. I'm asked to, you know, to wrap up in five minutes and uh, we can take one or two maybe burning questions from the audience. If you have any, please grab the opportunity. Okay, that gentleman. Yeah. Okay, or any other one, we can take one more. Uh, Robin? Yeah, yeah. Okay, just two questions, then we'll be closing the, the conversation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, DPM Ping and members of the panel. My name is David. I'm living in the East Coast. I'm looking forward to all the green initiative here. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one, uh, I truly appreciate the government support in green initiative. Take, for example, uh, buying an EV as opposed to an ICE car. I think there is a early adoption scheme, there is a, what you call a vehicle emission scheme that make the car price more affordable. Uh, but I'm not too sure or if there is a similar support for uh, Singapore uh, residents who want to support um, renewable energy like solar power to install say, solar panels on their own property, private properties. So I think currently there's none, but there are, I think, many residents or property owners who are interested. But because the initial cost is quite uh, big, and I think it's quite an obstacle to, to launch into it. So if there's similar initiative, I think the solar panel or the renewable energy in the private property owners sector will be greatly increased because the footprint there is relatively huge. I believe now, most uh, HDB town council have solar panels on the roof. Yeah. So this first question. Um, second question is, uh, again, I totally appreciate the, the, love, the foresight and the creativity of this Long Island project. I have one request. I hope this Long Island name is not already fixed 
because two things come to mind for Long Island. One is uh, the drink, for those under 18, of course, you not know, but Long Island is a cocktail. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, the second that maybe you're drawing some inspiration from New York, Long Island. But I think uh, for this project, we should have some name uh, which is finally adopted to be more local, more Singaporean. But I think we should give it a, a sense of a proudness rather than take uh, inspiration like Long Island, which is, to me, is quite foreign and quite uh, unrelated to the whole project. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you for the questions. And, uh, TPM, do you mind? Thanks. Yeah. So first, on, on your second point about why do we call it Long Island, I think that's just a working name. I fully, fully agree with you that we should find a more interesting name. And uh, maybe we should uh, have a naming contest to see what is the... Uh, and then we, citizens can vote on it and say, well, I, I would like to call this. But as part of the consultation that uh, the MND and MSC will do, and we'll work together to see how we can make this more interesting. And also, it's not just the Long Island. I think earlier on, Winston had shown the, the kind of a broad sketch of it. So I've also been uh, discussing with various uh, agencies, you know, from HDB to uh, MSE uh, and LTA and so on, about what we can do. So the plan is not kind of finalize that this is going to be exactly how it's going to look like. How we're going to do it is, is still a work in progress. The one thing which I should mention to everybody is that uh, we have actually started uh, island, uh, a fund where every year the Ministry of Finance will put, whenever we have uh, some budget available, we'll put it into this fund. And in fact, we have put in quite a few billion dollars already. Because as PM announced, it's going to cost us between 100 and 120 billion at least. So we better save up for our future. So getting our financing right uh, will be important. Uh, Esther mentioned about issuing green bond and so on. So we should think about how to use this. I also mentioned about green jobs earlier on for the young people. So there are lots of this work that we need to do uh, to protect this better. I, I should also mention that about a few years back, I went to uh, the Netherlands to study the, their coastal protection, their polders. I don't know any of you uh, as, have lived in Netherlands? Anyone? Yeah. Oh, you have? Oh, okay. So when I was in the Netherlands, I was told that there's a very common saying in the Netherlands that God created the earth, the Dutch built Netherlands. Yes, you're nodding. Maybe you should tell us a bit more why that is so. Would you like to share a few words about why they're saying? I, I, I don't have much to say on this. Huh? Um, you want to use the mic? Yeah, we have this. Yeah, no, I, I, I would like to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to say more, but... Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So I was, so I, I was told that uh, uh, how anyone of you have visited Holland, the Netherlands? Quite a few of Winston. you. Anyone of you have seen the windmills? Yeah. So you see the the Dutch windmills are beautiful, right? So I always thought, well, these are beautiful windmills, and they so they explained to me that these beautiful windmills are not there for decoration. They have a purpose because about a third of Netherlands is below sea level. So the windmills are used to pump water out into the sea. And that's why if you look at the beautiful landscape in the Netherlands, there are lots and lots of polders. So they're building the polders to keep the sea water out and the windmill to pump the water out into the sea. So, uh, we, so I visited some of the R&D units and uh, some companies and in fact, we, have, uh, we are also building polders. We have polders of uh, Pulau Tekong to uh, see what can be done, whether it will work for Singapore and so on. And the so-called Long Island project that we are doing you know, uh, derives from some of this learning that we have about coastal protection. How do you protect the coast? How do you pump water out in, you know, without using a lot of electricity? And so the windmills, for instance, is one uh, option. So I fully agree with you on that, on about the naming. Then on your first point about uh, EV, 
and, and uh, the um, so EV is one one part of the solution, but the most fundamental solution for our public transportation for pub is that we have Minister Corbyn announced a zero car growth policy, and we are going to stick by that. Right, so there will be no more uh, new cars. So it will be zero growth, and then with the zero growth policy, we are going to switch to uh, energy efficient vehicles. So the EVs come in, and then by about 2040, we should all we should be facing up petrol and diesel. But the other important part of it is, uh, I think Winston mentioned about the MRT system earlier on. So the most, we have one of the most extensive networks of the MRT network when it's done. And every house, 90% of households in Singapore will be within 10 minutes walk of an MRT. So public transportation, whether it's of buses or of uh, MRT, uh, will be the key mode of transporting people around Singapore. And that is the greenest mode you know, at the moment, other than walking, of course. Yeah. So, it, but even on walking, there's a lot of sheltered walkways being built around. So for the young people here, do enjoy uh, uh, walking around. And then, of course, there are so many new uh, things that you can do. Uh, I forgot to mention one thing about the young people here, that uh, any one of you are living in the East Coast area, Oh, quite a few. Okay, come and visit the. You know, we we have a project together with uh, Green Space Plus, and looking at what are the things that young people could do. You can become a green ambassador. There is also a SG Eco Fund that we can tap on, so you can be ground up projects. If you think that I have a great idea to do this, please use it. And then there's also uh, uh, so all this ground up initiative. So please make use of this to do something and you can of course join as our Green Ambassador. We have a Green Ambassadors program where you can go for training and undertake some of these activities. So thanks for that uh, question. I think, I hope that I've answered it. Yeah. Okay, I was told to actually close the, the uh, panel, but since Robin, you actually raised your hand, can you make it really quick? Yeah. Yeah, someone pass him the mic, please. Can someone help? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to take? Yeah. Okay. So DPM say we can take one more question from the young one, but make it short, okay? Robin first. Yeah. Okay, Robin okay, was sure. asking. Yeah. Thank you for both a great of you panel. can ask, answer ask yeah. the question. Ask the question and together. And then uh, we'll answer Robin? it quickly. Sure. Okay. I just want to ask a question about forests and urban heating. Right, there's no question that Singapore's done an incredible job at, at greening um, our streets and our residential areas, but we're also, at the same time, losing a lot of secondary forests. Um, we've lost, you know, we're losing Dover, we're losing um, Tenga, we're also gone. Now, lo losing these forests has implications for urban heat. And I want to ask um, Winston, uh, the rest of the panel, um, Deputy Prime Minister as well, how much of these secondary forests, which are very, very important for keeping the city cool, can we afford to lose? Do we have to keep developing? Do we have to keep cutting them down to build residential areas? I know it's a trade-off, but um, given climate change, how much of our secondary forests can we afford to lose? How much of our secondary forests is being... Can, afford to lose? can, can we, we afford, afford to lose, lose given urban heat island effect? Oh, I see. Okay. Can we take this uh, young gentleman's question? Then we can answer together, but we will have to keep it short because, yeah. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon to the panelists. So, I think the Paris Climate Agreement showed us how all of the countries of the world can unite to prevent the effects of climate change. But after a change in administration, after 2016's election in the US, we saw the US pulling out of the agreement. Now it's back in. So my question is, is there enough political and international will in the, com in the wider perspective for us to prevent or control the effects of climate change? <laughs> well, I suppose, yes. IPCC co-chair. Great, thank you. Uh, first, maybe Robin's question. Good question to ask. Uh, undoubtedly, more if we can maintain the amount of forests, uh, potentially try and grow new forests as well uh, with 
you know, with the advent of the Long Island, which I also find to be a clunky name, my own personal preference is calling it New East Coast. Maybe that would be a good idea, but I'll leave it at that. Uh, but how much to maintain is a policy question, I would believe, and that's not up to, well, I can advise as a scientist, I can say that, you know, this is the amount of cooling that can happen. Uh, you know, we know that uh, if we compare temperatures from forested areas with urban areas, you're looking at an average of a 4 to 5 degrees C difference at night from the heat island. Uh, re replacing that with park spaces, you still have that additional cooling. Um, some of you might know I'm the PI of the Cooling Singapore Initiative, and we mentioned the Bishan Amokyo Park area, and we've done some research indicating that we can see cooling of about one to one and a half degrees Celsius between Bishan Amokyo Park with the residential areas in Bishan and in Amokyo. So there is that discernible positive impact on cooling on top of the uh, ecosystem benefits that you have from less flooding or from more flora and fauna that move there. Uh, but we see the benefits of that, but as you pointed out, Robin, it's a trade-off. And I am hesitant as a scientist to say these are my views. It should be a collective decision, a policy decision, and how much we can afford to lose is best left to the wisdom of you know, the, the crowds in this sense. Uh, but as long as it's science-based, as long as it's based on what a lot of my peers and a lot of my colleagues have done in terms of the research, for these sort of nature-based solutions. And if that is included in the process, then I think we can make that uh, decision or that informed level of trade-off as much as possible. So hopefully that answers your question, Robin. And we can discuss that later. Uh, for the young gentleman in front, yes, in 2016, I can tell you when uh, a certain Donald Trump became president, there was a lot of um, Uncomfort, discomfort amongst policymakers when he pulled um, the US out of the Paris Agreement. But let it be said that it was very noticeable from my US colleagues that a lot of action took place in spite of the, um, the issues that, were, that plagued the White House. I'm not going to go into that controversy there, but a lot of um, state action. California, for instance, they put in massive amounts of funding, massive amounts of good green policies in place. So don't make the error of saying that the US is Donald Trump. There's a multitude of informed state level, city level people within the US who see the importance and who see the, I'll be blunt, the financial benefits of green policies within the US that can be enabled in spite of what's, what goes on at that federal level. So even though I'm not going to speculate what's going to happen in November of this year, uh, let's just say that within the IPCC, within the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change Level, uh, there is that push, the understanding that um, even if worse comes to worse, uh, a lot of anti-green policies come into place, the momentum that has happened over the past four years will keep going in spite of what happens in the change, you know, any change in leadership at the White House. Thank you, Winston, uh, DPM. You have the last words to wrap this up? Oh, no, I, I think uh, Winston has given a really, I fully agree with all, all that Winston has said. So first on the amount of primary forest and you know, your question about how much we can afford to lose. Well, uh, one of the constraints of Singapore is that it's really a tiny little island. 700 over square kilometers. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've been very lucky that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, our founding prime minister, was such a greenie before the term was even invented. And there are very few cities with such extensive green cover because he believes so deeply as to how important being green is. But as to the secondary and uh, for the primary forest, the you know, Minister Desmond Lee has been quite a greenie too. So he has been doing a lot of work. I mentioned that he had done the One Million Tree Program. He is extremely knowledgeable about many of these things. And also he has started all these environmental impact studies. So every of the project that we do, uh, if it is big enough, we go through an environmental impact study to see the impact. And there are also many other things that we can... You cannot possibly... Uh, say that every square inch of Singapore will remain as it is because then uh, no development can take place. But if there is ever a need to affect some parts, you know, what are some of the compensating things that you could do? And we try our best not to touch the primary forests. 
So even in the botanic gardens, you have a section that is a lot, um, that is quite natural. So those are some of the things that uh, we can do. Now to your question uh, about this, I fully agree with Winston that although uh, at some level you, President Trump was uh, walked out of many of these agreements, but that America is a very, very um, interesting and diverse society, and there are many, many people who are very passionate. I just give you one example. I, I recent about two, two three years back, I met with a group of presidents from California, and uh, they are all from the University of California, the different uh, universities. They are all presidents of those universities. They came to Singapore, and I said, "Oh, may I know your objective for visiting Singapore?" And they said, "Well, we want to discuss with Singapore." about climate action. I said, oh, I'm so surprised. I said, I thought your president doesn't believe in uh, climate change. And they all turned to the president of the University of California and said, she believes in it. <laughs> My president believes in it. And we had a very, very fascinating discussion about how we can work together. Uh, last year, I was in the US twice, in the East Coast and West Coast. I went to all the key universities to discuss with the researchers. And there was so much interest in the research work, number one. Number two, I also met a number of um, venture funds and a number of startups. So there is a lot of work that is going on in America where the venture funds and the private sector is very strong in this area. They are supporting lots of good work. One company that came to Singapore recently and had a long discussion with me because he is actually using AI for sustainability. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Really cutting edge work that he wants to do. And they say, how about doing it uh, you know, together with Singapore? I say, you're most welcome. So AI for, so right now the proposal is with them to consider. I hope he comes and say, let's do it together. And I'm very happy that the, uh, yesterday, was it yesterday or the day before, uh, I was at the launch of uh, Singtel's, Singtel has started a new data center, and it is a data center that is going to be green. So they have committed to, data centers, and the ones that are going to use AI, is very, very energy intensive. But they decided that if you can use AI well, to manage traffic, to manage many of these processes, you can cut waste, you can cut energy consumption significantly. So the data center itself should be green. And one of the uh, MOUs that they sign is with a company in Indonesia that is uh, able to do solar panels. There are so many islands in Indonesia, so they're going to have solar panels in the island and going to supply quite a lot of green electricity for the power grid and for, for the data center. So to all our young people, there are lots of interesting jobs that you can do. To I think this green data center is one good example. This how you can combine AI with sustainability is also another very, to me, a very exciting example. Yes, okay, thank you so much that, uh, wow. Well, the quick conclusion is the love for our planet really bring peoples together beyond the borders, age group or, you know, sectors as well. So there are always solutions, there's always hope that we can do better. And uh, with this, thank you very much for your spending the afternoon with us on a Saturday. Thank you, DPM, and thank you, Winston. Thank you. Uh, Esther, can I, can I say one last word? Of course. <laughs> So since all of you are so interested in the green courses, you know, uh, if, if we have your, your um, agreement, we'll be happy to uh, sort of give you some information about what the East Coast is doing on the green uh, action plan, to be green ambassadors, to, be, uh, to take part in our, world, from tree planting program to a recycling program to uh, various programs that our various green groups are doing and at the same time also 
uh, I will be uh, launching something in about 10 days, two weeks' time about completion of some green corridors. We also have uh, a lot of work on gardening and sustainability, community gardens and so on. So I, earlier on, I mentioned about living in a city where you see so much nature and greenery around us. So for those of you who are interested in doing community gardens, in, doing, uh, in growing fruits and vegetables around your neighbourhood, in greening up the place, in looking after butterflies or dragonflies, you are welcome to join the East Coast Green Plan and be part of this action and turn all our anxieties into action. Do something. Wonderful. Thank you. Over to you, uh, MJ. Thank you. All right. Thank you, DPM, Mr. Heng, Prof. Chow, and Mr. Esther An for such an engaging dialogue. Please remain on stage for a group photo. Yes, so. Oh. Yeah, perhaps, um, perhaps yeah, we can stand in, stand in a group. Yes, the photographer is right there. Oh, that will come soon, that will come soon. No, it's okay, you guys can go for it. I'll, I'll join later, I'll join later. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I, you know, as a content creator, I will use my phone and we, we can take a wee fee with everyone. So, um, I will need everyone to squeeze to the middle. I just nice y'all can stand up and like, have a little stretch. Yes, so we will stay here and then we'll face this way. And then I will take like a, a wee fee here. Yes, 0 0.5. Can everyone um, from the left and from the right, please? Just take a scan, stand and, and move to the middle. Yes, and have a little stretch. Come on, let's move to the middle. Just a good photo. And then refreshments is right outside waiting for us. All right. Everyone squeeze. Orange squeeze. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. Make sure you're not blocking anyone. Uh, the, for those on the first row, should they stand up? Or, okay, wait. Uh, I, I try to... Oh my goodness, hold on. Uh. Okay. Okay, you know what? I have to like move up a bit. Oh my goodness, my face is huge. All right, okay. We can do it this way. Okay. All right, okay. Hold on. Uh. Everyone squeeze inside. Okay, okay. One, two, three. All right. Sorry, wait, wait, one last one. The proper photo. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so we do a heart shape. Heart shape. Yeah, okay. Do look here? okay, look there. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Smile. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, everyone. So, just a quick reminder of a few exciting initiatives on the screen. Ooh. Can any. Screen, please, of the various initiatives that we have. So do follow CDL Sustainability to be updated with the latest programs that we have upcoming. And next, uh, next slide on East Coast Initiatives. So if you would like to join East Coast Green Program, you can also scan the QR code or approach the East Coast Sustainability Green Plan booth outside. And do follow East Coast Bus Instagram to find out more of the latest programs. So with that, we have come to the end of the event. Thank you again, DPM Mr. Heng Sui Kiet, Professor Winston Chow and Ms. Esther An for all your insights and wisdom. So everyone, you can please make your way outside the auditorium where we have prepared some refreshments for you. Bye-bye.